You guys are incredibly blessed to have Matt, Warren, Matt and Vivi leading you as a church. I think they have done a sensational job through what has been uncharted territories. It's very obvious to me that this church is in a great place, especially relative to a lot of other ch churches. It is not an easy job being a pastor, as you well know. All right, so come on, why don't we show some love and appreciation. <laughs> pastor Matt, we love you, mate. Done amazing. Let's not believe just to go through the motions today. We've got three sessions together. Let's believe for God to speak to our hearts in everyone. So you up for that? Well, come on, let's pray. Father, we want to give today to you. It's a huge honor to be in your presence. Thank you that you're here. And I pray that as we open your word, you'll show us amazing things and speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray for every man from the youngest to the oldest, those sat at the front, those at the back, those that are in a good place, but especially those that are in a dark place. God, would you minister and change them from the inside out, in Jesus' name, and everyone with a bit of faith said a deep amen. amen. That's good, that sounds good. Say amen again with a deep voice. Oh, very, very good. No high-pitched voices allowed today, all right? Just amen, all right. 2006 was my anus horribilis. I'm always careful not to say anus horribilis, but it's anus horribilis. I'd been back in Norwich for two years. We'd been out in Australia pastoring. We came back full of expectation to serve my father-in-law, who was the senior pastor. We came back as exec pastors, and we wanted to change the world, starting with Norwich. Within three months, we knew it just wasn't going to work. In the church uh, at the time that was called the Family Life Center, there's a lot of family in our church, 62 to be precise, and everyone had an opinion, and they didn't like these young upstarts coming back from Australia telling them what to do. They don't do it that way in Norfolk. And I remember that three months rolled into two years, and man, the pressure was building. Some of you have been in ministry. Some of you in your business place, you know what it is when the pressure builds and you can't sleep at night and your thoughts start to race and it's as if they start to control you. I literally couldn't control my racing thoughts. I tried everything. I tried running. I, I tried praying. I tried reading more of the Word, but it just seemed to get worse. I went to see my GP and he told me I needed to take uh, a month off work and he gave me some sleeping pills and some antidepressants. A lot of you have been there. And at the time I was being mentored by a guy, I'd got a business grant and I paid for a guy called Scott Wilson who worked with a team in London and I met with him once a month. And I told him that yesterday I'd been to the doctors and been prescribed this stuff. I hadn't taken any of them yet. I wasn't sure whether I should. And I, I talked to Scott and he looked me in the eye and he was an Aussie, a straight shooter. And he said, Steve, if you have to take them to do your job, you're in the wrong job. And he just hit me straight. And I knew we needed to make some changes. And so... We resigned from that role. A couple of weeks later, our church burned down. Second biggest fire in the history of the city. 53 fire engines. We built a multi-million pound building full of aspiration and we stood and watched as it literally burnt to the ground. One month later, Rachel's grandfather, the patriarch of the family who'd started the church, he died, so we couldn't leave then. The church was in mourning. And this period stretched out for six months, not knowing what we were gonna do, where we were gonna live. And I'd arranged to meet with Pastor Brian from Hillsong Church. That was in September, the Dominion Theater. And he said, Steve, you should come home. 
and he meant Australia. So we moved back to Australia. And we went back to Australia thinking that we were going to be something brand new at the time in Hillsong Church. It was to be service pastors. So I remember the 30th of January 2007, heading to the airport at Heathrow, and on the way to the airport, I got a call, and they asked me if, as well as being a service pastor, would I run the evening college, which was about 400 people at the time. I said, of course, I'd love to. Got on the plane, flew 25 hours to Australia, got off the plane, picked up my phone, there was a phone call, I needed to go to Mark Hopkins' office who led the college. So I went straight from the plane, straight to his office, he said, oh, we're, as well as service pastoring, running evening college, we need you to lecture in the college. I said, what do you need me to, to lecture? And it was 10 hours of lectures in total. Three hours with the first year, 600 in the, in the class with two pieces of assessment each term. Then the second years, it was a different topic, but the real killer was the third years. It was three hours a week of philosophy of ministry, postmodernism, all the heavy stuff. And I went from that office into Gloria Jean's coffee shop. Where else do you go? You go for a coffee. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm thinking, I've got to be a service pastor. I've got to run the evening college. I know I've got a lecture on top 10 hours a week. Where am I going to get the time? And immediately, my mind started to go again. Have you ever been at that point where you think, I'm just going to break down here? That was a tough, tough day. Thank God for my beautiful wife, who is very much like the Holy Spirit, like some of yours, thankfully. And she came and she looked me in the eye and encouraged me and prayed for me, said, you're going to do this. I then booked myself in for an appointment with Robert Ferguson, who looks was very much a spiritual father to us over there. I walked him into his, his office expecting a bit of love and TLC and I didn't get much. <laughs> he looked at me, he said, you know what your problem is? And I didn't, I didn't know what my problem was. I didn't think the problem was me. He said, you know what your problem is, Steve? He says, you're too English. Now he's English as well, so I'm thinking. He said, you want everything in a box? You wanna be able to do everything because that's the way you've been brought up, but sometimes God takes you out of the box. And he gave me a scripture, spoke this over my life, 2 Timothy 1, verse seven. He said, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And let me read that to you again. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Man, that thing hit me between the eyes. God really helped me through that incredibly difficult season. Some of you are in a difficult season. Let's be honest, most men have been through this pandemic where you look at all your responsibilities in church, in life, in your family, in your business, and sometimes it's so overwhelming, so intimidating. When I stood in Gloria Jean's coffee shop, that moment I'm thinking, I'm just the lad from County Durham, from a little place called Rushy Ford. And that voice started to tell me all the things I couldn't do. You know what? Within a year I'd done all that stuff and grown it, not because I'm good, but because God is good. He doesn't come to make you timid, to shrink back, to make you small. He's come to give you his power, his love, and a sound mind. So we're gonna break open this scripture. Got a couple of sessions with you. So I'm gonna to talk to you about, here's the title if you're making notes, I recommend you do. It's established, not intimidated. All right, come on, get your phones out. Established and not intimidated. And by the way, I'm gonna break you into groups. I'm not gonna to talk to you for 35 minutes. I'm gonna break you into groups. So established, not intimidated. First session today, we're gonna to focus on this, what God hasn't given you. 
And then later on this afternoon, what God has given you. The first one is a bit more challenging. The second one will be a bit more encouraging. For the Spirit of God does not make us timid. You know, I don't read that God has a spiritual gift for you called timidity. That word just jumped out at me. God doesn't make me timid. When you are timid on the inside, you're living in timid aided or in timid Asian. Timidity is ruling you and living in you and controlling you. If the enemy can intimidate us, he can influence us. So let me give you a definition of timid. It's lacking in courage or self-confidence. Lacking in boldness or determination. I love synonyms. Anyone else like synonyms? What are the synonyms of timid? It's faint-hearted, fearful, or here's my personal favorite, mousy. Ever felt mousy on the inside? I'll come back to that in a moment. But this is what the enemy wants to, do, wants to do in you, especially post-pandemic. He wants to make you timid, small, small in our thinking. But the Bible said the spirit God gave us, he doesn't make us timid. Why don't we repeat this? Come on, let's hear those deep voices. Repeat this after me. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid. That's what we like. When I first came back from Australia, this time, we were there for another 12 years, I went with my brother to play golf in Scotland. And they're a funny bunch up there, aren't they? And uh, I was driving up to Scotland. Do we have any Scottish people here? Good. All right. <laughs> any Italians? Even better. All right. So just not being racist, I'm just being wounded. All right. <laughs> We were driving up to Scotland, and me and my brother were bought up on a farm, so I'm loving the hay bales out there. Good work, whoever got that. And so we're driving up to play golf up there, and it was a long drive, because it was up to Aberdeen, and it was the middle of the summer, and I'm looking at all these wheat fields. I, lo I love wheat and barley and all that stuff. Now, when I grew up on the farm, the wheat seemed to grow to about this high. Now, obviously, I wasn't as big, so maybe it was that high, all right? But I was driving up to Scotland, I'm looking at this wheat thinking, something's wrong here. Because it was all about that high. Have you noticed some of the wheat now? Is it, so I'm saying to my brother, who still works on the farm, said, what the heck's with that? Doesn't it grow in Scotland? And he says, no, it's not that. He said, now farmers, they, they spray on wheat something called a growth inhibitor. And literally, it stops the wheat growing too tall because the taller it gets, the more susceptible it is to the wind and can get damaged. So farmers spray on it a growth inhibitor. Now I think the enemy is constantly looking to spray a growth inhibitor on your life, on your family, on your future, even on the church. Tries to keep it small. I learned another lesson when I was much younger. I was working for the YMCA. Do you all want to sing it? Why? No, we won't do that. But uh, I wonder whether we can get those. Have we got those two chairs? Can you bring them up? Here is a lovely lady whose name I forgot. It begins with S, doesn't it? Liz. It's got one S in it, if you spell it that way. So give it up for Liz. Look at, it. Look at Liz. Thank you, Liz. There we go. So I'll just pop them over here. So I'm working in a high school and I got the job of taking the naughtiest kids in the whole of Norfolk. They'd all been excluded from school for spitting on teachers and all that kind of stuff. And I got the job of entertaining them for a week. So we decided to do a bike ride. We took them from the Welsh coast, from the Langollen Path to Sheringham. And it was 250 miles in five days, 50 miles per day on and off road on mountain bikes. I don't know what I was thinking. Somebody should have shot me. But I decided to do this. First night, pulled up in some YMCA hostel. They're up on the roof. They're throwing things at the residence. I'm thinking this is a bad idea. But as part of the training, there was a guy uh, there called Paul Roberts. And man, he was a big unit. He was thick set. He was like 
flip an egg. I wouldn't want to upset him. And we were doing this mountain bike training and session number one, we were riding through the country and we came to a style. Now this is not a style, but it represents a style. You know how a style in the country, you step up. Now I'm, I'm hoping I can do this because I'm 105 kilograms, I think. You step onto it, then you step over and then you go on the other side. So I get, we get to this style, I carry my mountain, mountain bike over, I'm on the other side, and I'm saying to Paul, who's over here, this big lad, come on Paul, over you go. He picks up his mountain bike and he looks at it, and then he puts his bike down. I'm thinking, come on mate, get over it. He just says, I'm not doing it. He says, what do you mean? He says, I'm not doing it. And he blatantly refused to do it. I'll tell you a bit about Paul. He was brought up in Holland. And he couldn't read or write. So when he got to school, he couldn't study, didn't understand anything, thought he was thick, and ended up getting in trouble with his fists. And he learned in life that he wasn't bright enough, he's not intelligent enough, and so when it came to any type of challenge in life, instead of stepping up, he had learned to step back. He was physically incredibly capable, but internally incredibly weak. In other words, timidity was on the inside. It's got nothing to do with how you look on the outside. When you feel timid, you don't step up, you shrink back. You start listening to all the reasons why you can't do certain things. And here's what happens is you get used to living in your comfort zone. And God is on the other side of the stile and he's saying, will you step up? Will you get out from your comfort zone and will you step into the faith zone. Go where you've never been. Do what you've never done. And some of you men, God is saying to you, I want you to step out from your comfort zone and let's face it, in a pandemic, it's really easy to get used to the comfort zone. You start to like a lot of aspects of working from home and seeing the kids and getting your routines and your patterns and challenges come up and a little voice says, well, no, you don't need to do that. So many people are stepping back when God says, hey, I've got so much more for you in your faith zone. So let me ask you, as a man and as a leader right now, how timid are you on the inside? Are you confident about stepping up into what God has for you or have you learned to get comfortable where you are? When was the last time you stepped out of your comfort zone and into the faith zone? Timothy was in his comfort zone. In fact, he was in that place I was in, in Gloria Jeans. If you look at the passage at the start of 2 Timothy 1, the Apostle Paul writes to him and says, man, I'm praying for you, and I'm mindful of your tears. Timothy was intimidated. There's lots of other examples in Scripture of people who God wanted to step up, but they stepped back. The one that I often think of is Saul and David. When Goliath stepped into the faith zone and said, hey, who's going to come and fight me? And who should have fought him? Saul. The Bible said he was head and shoulders above everyone. He was a fighter. He was the commander in chief. But he didn't have the courage to step into the faith zone. And yet he's this little geezer, David, who's the one his dad didn't even figure would even qualify. And what's he doing? He, he's the deliveroo guy. He's taking the bread and cheese to the boys at war. He's driving his little moped thing, what's going on? And he hears Goliath, and what does he do? He steps up. He doesn't shrink back. 
he steps up. I'm going to put a great quote on the screen, hopefully, from Leonard Ravenhill. He said this, a man who is intimate with God is not intimidated by man. What a great thought. The difference between David and Saul was not how big they were on the outside. It was all about how big they were on the inside. Saul was an oak tree on the outside, but he was a bonsai on the inside. David, on the other hand, he was huge on the inside. Another quote, the world within you creates the world around you. It's not how you look on the outside. And I love the scriptures in Hebrews 10, 35 and Hebrews 10, 38 to 39. It says this, do not throw away your confidence. Some of you once had confidence, but it's drifted away, it's drained away, you're thrown away. The things that you would have stepped up into in the past, the enemy's got in your head. And so now it's easier to step back. Did you notice how the pandemic affected your confidence, your decision making, your belief? But it says in verse 38, but my righteous one will live by his feelings. Does it say that? No, it says my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith. The word shrink back in Greek, hypostole means literally timidity. In life, there's lots of things that will cause you to shrink back, convince you that you don't have what it takes, like the enemy did to me in Gloria Jeans. I wanna talk to you today, not about stinking thinking, but about shrinking thinking. That's a thing, you know. You know, I see this a lot in Britain, interestingly. Pastor Brian often says this, the smaller the island, the smaller the thinking. British mindsets will keep you small. Lockdown mindsets will keep you small. Most Christian mindsets will keep you small. Have you ever noticed how society is shrinking everything down? Euro 2020. What was that about? It's 2021. But anyway, Euro 2020. If you wanted to catch up on a game, you had three options, didn't you? You could watch the full replay on iPlayer, or you could watch the highlights, which was about half an hour, or you can now watch a short of three to four minutes. Beware of things that summarize or short you or reduce you down. You know, we do it to ourselves, we define ourselves by our dysfunctions by the things that we can't do. We're not the only ones, of course. Jeremiah did it, I cannot speak. Moses did it, I can't speak. Gideon, I'm from the least. We dim and diminish ourselves. Another great quote. We look at ourselves and see all that we're not. But God looks at us and sees all that we are. For the Spirit of God does not make us timid. Let me tell you how this works. I think I've told you this story before, but I grew up in the Northeast. It's kind of like the armpit of England, isn't it? Let's face it, all right? And uh, my family were not really big on education. It might have been because my dad, um, when he graduated from school, all of, he was from a place called Rushy Ford. It was defined by the Rushing Ford Little River. There's only about 80 people lived there. About 20 kids went to his school. And on the day of graduation, they, they all lined up and the head teacher went down the line and spoke over each of the children, compliments about what they were gonna achieve. When he came to my dad, he said, he said, Morstan, you will bring untold misery on your parents. And he walked to the next person. It's literally what he said to my dad. So my dad didn't have a great experience of education. No one in our family history had ever gone to university. I was the first, I went to London Bible College, you little beauty, and I got a 2-1, all right, some respect here in the house, all right, but I remember the first, first semester in London Bible College, I was asked to preach 
at this church, and it was meant to be Donald Guthrie, this esteemed theologian who's written commentaries this thick, and he couldn't make it. I think he was about 98 at the time, so I don't know why they invited him, but anyway, you know, he physically couldn't make it, so they asked me. I'm 18. And I'm nervous as anything. And I went to the assistant principal and I I was thinking on preaching and I was going to use a a piece of art. And I remember him looking down his nose at me and said, he said this, he said, Morstan, you're not really the sort of person that would use art, are you? I wanted to punch him, but I didn't. But at the moment, the moment that he said that, a seed went into my head that I'm not that smart. I'm not as able as those people that were around me. I don't speak as well. And even though I graduated with a 2-1, in my head, I thought, I've gone as far as I can. If I was in a room and there was someone really smart, I always felt intimidated and I would be quiet. And secretly, my passion and love is for God's Word. I love it. And I always wanted to go further and study more, but I felt I'd hit my ceiling. I'd come to the style and decided... I daren't go over. 25 years later, I'm in Brisbane. And we take on this church called Garden City Church, a huge Pentecostal church. Pastor Brian sent me and Rachel up to help them transition. And there's this crazy guy called Dr. Van Shaw. He did his PhD in the book of Revelation. We all call him Van Google. You can ask him any question and he'll give you the answer. Speaks fluent Greek. And, and every time I met him, we'd talk about the word. And he, he looked me in the eye and said, Steve, you should do your master's. And I'd always come up with an excuse. Retreat back into my comfort zone. But thank God for a year, he kept eyeballing me, prophesying over me, speaking to me. He saw things in me that I couldn't see in myself. So I enrolled on a master's. I've never been so petrified in all my life. 25 years since academic writing, I did my degree before there were computers. I didn't know how to foot, footnote and use Zotero. I didn't know what tensors were. In the school I went to, for some reason, they stopped, stopped speaking English, gra- teaching English grammar. I didn't know a verb, I didn't know a noun. Now I had to learn how to write in certain tenses. Everyone else in the room knew, I'm Googling what is the present tense. And they said at that first subject, the goal, the aspiration for each of you should be to have your 20,000 word thesis published in an academic journal. I'm thinking, yeah, right. If I just survive and scrape through, it will be a miracle of God. So I got through, came to my final thesis, 20,000 words. I picked one Greek word. I told you about it before. Romans 8, 37, we are more than conquerors. It was a great word to spend a year of your life studying. I wrote my paper, I got 80%, passed my masters. Six months later, my supervisor came to me and said, Steve, I want to present your paper in an academic journal. I said, you're joking, she says, no, I wanna publish it. Here is the journal, it's a journal of Pentecostal theology on reception history. You flick through this, there's PhDs, professors, assistant professors from some of the great universities of the world, and then there's Steve Morstan, leadership coach from England. They publish my thesis. How good is that? Some of you, so much that God has put inside you. God didn't give you that spirit of timidity. He's saying, hey, it's time to step up. It says, God did not give you a spirit of timidity, but of power. Matt started by reading from Acts chapter two. Acts one, it says, you shall receive power, ability, capacity, In Greek, it's that word dunamis. Literally, there's dynamite within you. God didn't give you timidity. He's given you power.